to influence government policies for the benefit of its members. That's what they're interested in. Second, they lobby to get what they want. Of course, that takes from the first one. To lobby simply means to go about doing all what you can to make sure that government policies is formulated in such a way that members, their members, I mean, are benefited. The third is they do not present candidates to the voters. They don't field candidates in, in, during the election. They're only interested in the benefit they will get from the government by influencing the government policies. How do pressure groups operate? We shall be talking about that under mode of operation. How do they operate? First, they air their grievances through mass media, the newspaper, the television, or the radio. That is how they operate. Secondly, peaceful demonstration. If teachers, for instance, under the National Union of Teachers, are aggrieved, are not paid salary, they are offended, they are not happy, they cannot feed their children because they do not have money, they do not carry arms, they do not destroy government property. They simply demonstrate peacefully to air their views, to tell the government that they should be remembered, to tell the government that they are not happy. That is one way they operate. Secondly, they could decide not to work again. That simply means they go on strike. And finally, ultimatum. They could decide to give government three days, four days, or a week to react to their demand. After the expiration of the ultimatum and nothing is done, they simply decide to go on strike. And of course, it's most likely that ultimatum will always come before a strike is embarked upon. We shall not be talking about functions of pressure group. What are the functions? How do we benefit from them? What is their relevance in the society? One may want to ask. One. They serve as watchdog over public policy. Yes, of course, by going on strike, giving government ultimatum, and of course educating the masses and all of that, they serve as watchdog over public policy. Second, they are a link between the government and the people. Yes, because of course when Nigerian Labour Congress, for instance, goes on strike, which is a pressure group, for instance, because of the hike in fuel price, they are trying to attract the attention of the government to a very important aspect of people's life. And when government yields to such a demand to reduce, for instance, pump, the pump price of fuel, that is to benefit the, the, the masses. So in such a way, pressure groups serve as a link between the government and the people. Again, they check misrule. Of course, this takes from the second one. When the government is beginning to misrule or the political party is in power is beginning to misrule, it is the pressure group that serves as a check to such. And finally, they educate their members on their political rights. We shall now be talking about the differences between political parties and pressure group. Of course, there are a number of differences between the both. One, the aim of members of political party is to win elections. But that is by far the aim of pressure groups. For pressure groups, they are interested in influencing the government, sorry, government policies. That's what they are interested in. They are not interested to win political parties, to, to win elections. Second difference between political parties and pressure groups is members of pressure groups are often, I take that again, members of pressure groups are after their own interest. They are not interested in what happens to everybody. They are interested in what happens to members of their group. But for political parties, they have the interest of the nation at heart. Again, members of political parties are more impressive than members of pressure groups. Political parties to recruit members from every walks of life. But that is not the case with members of pressure groups. Members of pressure groups must belong to a particular field of study, for instance, you cannot just join the National Union of Teachers if you're a medical doctor. What are you doing there? Neither can you join an association of medical doctors if you're a carpenter. So, their members must be people from the same field of study. Let us now respond to a number of questions. First, name four types of pressure groups. Of course, I'm sure you remember economic pressure group, religious pressure group. 
I'll ask the second question. List two features of two-party system. I'm sure you remember the answer to this question. For two-party system, the one feature that should come right into your head is that there must be two parties constitutionally recognized in such a system. And of course, it is democratic and there is room for opposition party. And finally, enumerate two demerits of one party system. One is that it could lead to dictatorship. Again, press freedom is highly curtailed. That is a demerit of, of one party system. We shall take a summary of what we have done so far. We have discussed government. We started with the definition of government as an institution of the state. We talked about government as a process of governing and of course as a field of study. We went ahead to look at the concept of government. We talked about a different concept, the rule of law, liberty, freedom. We talked about a whole lot of things concerning concept of, law, of, of government. We call it looking into types of political parties. Looked into the one-party system, the two-party system, and the multi-party system. We did talk about the pressure group. We strike a balance between the pressure group and the political party, saying that while the political party is interested in winning an election, pressure group is interested in influencing government policy for the benefit of its members. We did talk about constitution as a, a document containing how powers of the states are shared among the central government and the corporate government in a federal system of government anyway. And of course, how the people in the citizens are governed. We talked about constitutionalism as different from constitution. We said that constitutionalism is the belief in the constitution. Of course, we did talk about citizenship, how one obtains citizenship. We said that the citizen of a country has some benefit he enjoys, and the non citizen has some benefit he or she does not enjoy. One can be a citizen of a country by birth, one can be a citizen of a country by marriage. One can do that by naturalization. We talked about a whole lot of things concerning how one could become or one of the differences between citizen and non-citizen. A citizen can hold political election, well, a non political position rather, while a non-citizen cannot hold elective position. Yes. As a citizen of a country, no one demands for a visa. You have free movement around the country. But as a non-citizen, you must enter into the country by fulfilling some rules and regulations stipulated. One of which is the presentation of your visa. I am sure you'll be wondering how you are going to pass this examination. You have to read. What we have done so far is just to aid what you are going to do. You need to remember the things I have said. You need to go over them again and again. Then you need to complement this with what effort you are going to put by reading your books. Ask questions. Make sure you ask questions whenever you are confused. Meet people who you think know better than you do. Ask them questions, get a perspective, and improve yourself. If you do these and many more, I am very sure, very sure you would succeed. I remain your government tutor, Justice Mbibisi Otunye.